female led tech company that has really brave, courageous ideas. And we're trying to do them in a non hierarchical way. So we're really trying to collaborate and come up with new processes and structures that allow, you know, the best ideas to come to the, to the top, not the ideas at the top to be deemed as the best. Uh, and that's been, yeah. I, I think I went off on way more of a tangent than you asked, but I think, yeah, education it has so many forms and um, I'm so grateful that I dropped out of school <laughs> and just like yeah. started my business and learned by doing because you can't be taught those things in a classroom. Have you ever met someone and thought their job sounded cool? Or perhaps you're wondering how you can get to a position that doesn't seem to match any of the qualifications you have at the moment. Well, if so, this podcast is for you. We found some people with jobs that you might not necessarily know about or expect people to have, and we're going to ask them about how they got there. Welcome to What Do They Do? A podcast about jobs and how people got them. Oh, welcome everyone. So really, really pleased today to be joined by Drew. Um, Drew and I actually met in London and since then kind of kept a bit of a connection and really, really pleased to, to have Drew on. So without further ado, Drew, welcome to the podcast. And what do you do? Thanks, Ben. It's really nice to see you again and uh, to be in the space with you. And yeah, for the invitation to be here, it feels really cool to to dive into some discussions that we may have started almost a year ago um, and to see where this goes. So, yeah, my name is Drew. I use they, them, he, and pronouns. I currently work as the head of experience with a learn tech company called Braindate that helps facilitate peer learning environments at events and within organizations around the world. Uh, so what that means is I help manage a team of experienced producers that bring our technology to life. Ultimately, it's an experiential technology, which means that the goal is to get human beings face to face into a conversation, whether one on one or in a small group around topics that they're curious about or experts in uh, to allow knowledge transfer to happen in sort of the basic most human form possible discussion. Uh, so that's the job that I have now uh, professionally uh, and takes up most of my time. Uh, but I am also a freelance uh, facilitator and artist um, and community builder. So that takes shapes in a lot of different ways. Um, but mostly these days I'm working on some dance films with a community dance project that I've been involved in for the last 10 years. Um, and I am also part of a group of wellness instructors that bring, you know, meaningful human connection to life in a Pilates studio here in Montreal, where I am based. Is that perfect answer? For, uh, what do you do? Like, I keep on saying it. And if people are consistent listeners, they'll be like, here he goes again. Uh, like, it's not one thing. And I love that. Um, okay. so lots, really lots to get into. So if you start, yeah. So like I became aware of your work at an event in London. So I was attending EdTechX, I think it was. Yeah. And so my, my perspective was I've been given this information about all the sessions, but then there was this other aspect to the event, which was that I could essentially through brain day, I could kind of either suggest a topic that I was interested in and kind of open that out for people to join me at a specific time. Or I could scan through the topics that were already there and I could kind of sign up to join. And so I did. Uh, I put a topic there, which one person came along and we had a good conversation about. And then we also got involved in a brain date with Sophie Bailey, founder yeah. of Worktrip, who was there uh, as well. So yeah, like, it's interesting from the tech space because it's very much human centered, human yeah. connection centered, and the tech just sort of enables that to happen. And uh, I think you spotted, I was fairly enthusiastic about the concept. <laughs> yeah, it was your first time experiencing Brain Day from what I remember. And um, it's truly, it's, it's such a simple concept in once you experience it. Um, but the impact is so huge. And 
for everyone who, I mean, not everyone, but those who brain date and understand the the value of that exchange, it's always the first time they interact with it where, you know, something is transformed in them where they can sort of realize, wait a minute, we're just human beings showing up to the same place at the same time. And what would be possible if we were given a tool that allowed us to sort of self-direct a little bit more of the content that we're interacting around and the connections that we're hoping to make or you know, from our perspective, the knowledge that we're hoping to to gather for attending that event. Um, so yeah, it was really really cool to meet you in the in the Brain Date Lounge where we had that conversation, and then naturally we continued to to have conversations beyond that point because we had that human connection and felt somehow less awkward about you know getting to know each other beyond our job titles or you know sort of expanding our vision as to you know oh there's a whole human being in front of me here they're not just here for work they're also here because they're alive and living through their life and hoping to you know grow in more than just professionally uh, and so that's what really touched me about meeting you as well i remember you were really available to to be a whole human being in that moment and sort of shift the idea of networking towards just relational building, uh, which at, at its foundation is really what networking is. And I think when networking is done at its best, it's about real relationship building. Because I, there's this sort of extrovert, introvert that people will kind of describe themselves as. And then that can manifest itself in like the word networking to some, particularly people who would say they're introvert networking is kind of a horrifying thing for them yeah. um and at these events you know you go to the scheduled sessions but any event i've been, ever been involved in what the, the 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 best feedback comes back from oh what was the best thing about the conference generally it's oh the network i made the people i met but for i find i find just to walk into a room and start butting in on people's conversations does not come naturally so I was really appreciative of having a mechanism, <laughs> like yeah. an official way to go, this isn't weird that I've come over. We've both agreed that we're going to have this <laughs> conversation. And then it goes from there. So I think that was kind of what initially intrigued me. But then I obviously found out <laughs> that, and, and key to the podcast, in terms of what you do, yes, there's the brain date work that you do. And recently we've been trying to pin down a date and you've been traveling a lot with, with work. Mm -hmm. I assume that's like to different events and yeah. similar to the one that you did in London. Exactly. So yeah, brain date, you know, travels the world and brings these experiences to life. And I, as the head of experience, have the pleasure to, to travel to different places and different parts of the world to collaborate with our clients and to you know, help them design optimal experiences. So yeah, this year already I've been uh, back and forth to Europe. I was in Singapore. I've been to the States um, and it's been a lot of fun. It's really amazing to see how this, you know, experience is there's like a common thread that, you know, regardless of what country you're in or what industry the event is being held in, at the end of the day, people always feel so nourished by having a space that they can show up as themselves and also like you said set those intentional connections up um the value that comes from that is is always yeah so so beautiful to see and to be, to witness so I, I i count myself really lucky to be able to to witness these experiences happening and and to share that sort of ancient form of human connection in in this in the world that we're in now so yeah but i suppose we obviously we met post, it was post pandemic, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the first summer really post pandemic. It was 2022. So mm. 2021, there was a summer. I think there were some live events happening, but not many. Uh, and this was the first summer of like, okay, we're going fully back to live. Let's see what happens. And uh, yeah, it was a whirlwind of a summer for us. We had way more events than we had actually anticipated because the hunger for connection was so was so real. Um, so yeah, that's when we met. And in terms of, I mean, I, I assume that therefore you're seeing a lot of a desire to like get back in person and and meet again. Um, in terms of your own, like what you do, was travel something that you'd always wanted to do as part of that? Is that a big bonus in terms of the travel or was that a bit of you do it? <laughs> 
you suck it up. Despite. For me, it was a big part of taking this job, actually. So um, before working at Braindate, I've always been self-employed and I've been, you know, a freelance artist and yoga teacher. And so I was, was able to create my own schedule and travel for different gigs and be in different places. Um, and that was important to me to, you know, see different parts of the world and interact with different people and communities. Uh, it's always been a part of my sort of existence. And uh, when I found Braindate as a company, and that's, you know, part of what they're one of the benefits of working with the company is that it's completely remote. You can work from anywhere in the world and travel is included depending on what team you're on in your job description and expectation. Um, so for me, especially coming through this side of the pandemic, when the world was reopening, it felt really exciting for me to get back out there in the world and really uh, discover what other people were feeling and thinking and where their heads were at. And um, I'll tell you that, you know, we, we, we serve a wide range of clients and demographics. And at all the events, there were many common themes that were coming up around, you know, wanting to make sure that their presence had the value that was, you know, that they were taking the time and energy to show up in person and that they were going to get something valuable out of it, yet they could still be in control of, who they were seeing, in what format they were meeting up, and have a sense of a more self-directed track that perhaps pre-pandemic might not have been as valuable or understood as valuable at the time. Um, and underneath all of that was that you know human longing to be heard and to be seen and to feel you know included in something again. Really interesting to to kind of hear the aspects of the work that you do and kind of what really a appeals. And we've heard a little bit there about the the dance, the community work, the yoga. So I, I suppose I'm interested now to ask, if we go back to sort of Drew growing up or through school, college, whatever it was, what were the aspirations? Did you imagine yourself having a, you know, a job that you could travel in or what was mm -hmm. the dream? The dream back then i love this question um i don't know how much travel was like clear as being my dream my real dream was i wanted to work with people i wanted to help people feel more nourished and connected um so as a theater background you know as a theater artist background it was always and i was and for context i was doing theater and music since i was you know six seven years old professionally as a, you know as a classically trained singer that worked in professional opera contexts and you know continued on to train and work professionally in musical theater and then into dance and more contemporary art um but my driving force was always wanting to create experiences where people felt more alive and felt vi in, you know invigorated by the shared moment that they were in and that naturally over time as i discovered yoga as a practice for you know mindfulness and self knowledge it enhanced my skill set and my vision of way you don't just have to create a performance for people to gather to and have them feel something. This can happen on a day to day basis. This can happen in, you know, different forms of human connection. Um, and that's always been, yeah, I never knew what I would be for a while. I thought I'd be a doctor maybe, um, or an architect because my grandfather and my father were architects. So I was toying with different forms of like, is it design that I want to do or is it, uh, medicine that I want to do? And, my natural talents were in communication and movement and production. So like pulling together the right people to contribute towards a common goal and motivating them towards achieving that. Um, so I sort of naturally fell into through theater and then into running my own wellness studio for several years up until the pandemic. Um, and through the pandemic, we decided to shift things and close down our physical brick and mortar spaces. And then Braindate arrived as an opportunity for me. And here we are two years later, and I'm so in awe. Like this job, honestly, is something I never thought I would have. I always thought I would be uh, more of an entrepreneur and continuing to sort of lead a ship of sorts. Um, but after, you know, the, the effects of the pandemic was really 
a lot happened to my business, but also in my personal life in terms of my mental health and physical health. And I needed to sort of scale back and find a project that I could contribute to, but not necessarily be the leader of. Um, I do have a leadership position within Brain Day, uh, which is great, um, but I'm not the one like at the front of the boat. <laughs> um, so it feels really good to, to be in this space. And to answer your question more succinctly is I did not ever dream I would have this job, but I'm in awe of seeing how my background and my sort of holistic makeup of who I am is able to be applied in this setting and have impact uh, uh, in the work that we're doing with Brain Day. And then, so Dean and I, who set up the podcast, are both from an education background, worked in schools. And I, I think a lot of why where this podcast came from was our doubt about the effectiveness of school in actually preparing anyone <laughs> for what they do after. Because I think in a in a sort of traditional education setting, if if the vision is set on you know working for a tech company, which is a, you know could be described as what you do, then having sort of opera and dance and yoga and entrepreneurial skills wouldn't necessarily be the obvious skill set for it. But obviously, hearing you talk, you can see how all of that that desire to bring people together works so well with what you do. So mm. that's the really interesting thing for me about the skill set that goes into what people do is so much more broad than mm. maybe school offers. But I may be speaking out of turn. Was your, was your school experience in any way similar to that? <laughs> um, I love this question. I'm actually like a university dropout. Um, uh, and... That was because I realized, you know, you have a lot of skills, you know what you want to do with your business, just go do it. And I'm of the school of life. Like I always learn by experience. I'm a very experiential learner. And I didn't find that institutionalized academic setting was the place where I learned best. Um, I felt it was actually taking a toll on my physical health. And I was like, this isn't the right space for me to be in as someone who grew up more of as a, as a physical learner. My first, my first diploma in dance and theater was in a conservatory program. So we weren't, you know, reading books that much. We were in our bodies and actually, you know, producing work and engaging in the craft. Um, and that worked incredibly well for me. Um, but I do remember my parents always saying, you know, we want you to consider a well-rounded education. And that doesn't mean like learning books necessarily. And they were always, I was really fortunate to have parents that had that perspective and that encouraged me in the areas where I naturally uh, had uh, strengths or had fun or was engaging in the work. And they were very, very generous in pushing me in that direction. Um, so I was lucky to to have that experience. And I do think that, you know, all of that life experience and the, the trust that they had in me to be a creative being on the planet and forge my own path um, is definitely something that's given me a lot of confidence in trusting myself um, and in overcoming things like imposter syndrome um, and entering new spaces. And I'll, I'll be fully transparent. When I first started working with Brain Day, because it was my first quote unquote corporate job, though the culture at Brain Day doesn't really feel corporate at all, I still had moments of huge sort of imposter syndrome. I was like, how did I end up in this seat? Like, are, are, did they, are they sure they chose the right person? And, and over and over, I just had to come back to, you know, my practice of saying, dude, you've got this, like, trust your skill set ask questions, learn out loud, collaborate in the ways that you know how because of your past. And I think there's different forms of education uh, that really inform the ability to listen, the ability to show up for other people, the ability to, you know, sit back and think critically from a completely different lens as someone. And ultimately, as long as, you know, a human being is empowered to communicate their thoughts and ideas and the organizational structure allows for it really i think that is where that is where the magic happens uh in in work 
life as far as I see it, for, whether it's in the theaters, in the theater with other people, whether it's been in building my business for eight years with a business partner and the 44 staff that we led to now, you know, working in, um, you know, a female led tech company that has really brave, courageous ideas. And we're trying to do them in a non hierarchical way. So we're really trying to collaborate and come up with new processes and structures that allow, you know, the best ideas to come to the, to the top, not the, ideas at the top to be deemed as the best. Uh, and that's been, yeah, I, I think I went off on way more of a tangent than you asked, but I think, yeah, education it has so many forms and, um, I'm so grateful that I dropped out of school <laughs> and just like yeah. started my business and learned by doing because you can't be taught those things in a classroom. So as you know, I said about Instagram real moments. I think I've got one there. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. No, tangents are good. Tangents are always good. Um, I, I also the dropout bit as well. I think I, with my so I've got I've got two uh, two young boys at eight and eleven, and it's really interesting hearing you say about that your parents provided that opportunity to. The, it sounds like they could see what gave you passion and got you excited and were in no mood to stand in the way of any of that. And I think that's the bit I'm always hoping with, with my children is that they realize, you know, work hard at things and be positive about things, but yeah, I, you want to see them happy. Um, mm -hmm. and, I th and I feel like with everyone we speak to, when they find a kind of passion and purpose that seems to be generally the source the magic special source that that kind of brings it all together i think it's interesting around skills because i i get into job descriptions quite a lot I like having looked through a lot of job descriptions, they're very intimidating things. You talked about imposter syndrome, like mm -hmm. reading a job description is a great way to go. Well, that doesn't, I can't do half. <laughs> I can't do any of that. But in theory, it's a job that supposedly you would be able to do. But like your job role at Brain Date, presumably the job description didn't ask for, well, you need to have been an entrepreneur. You need to have a background in theatre and dance, you, you know, that while the none of that would have presumably been on the job description, you can kind of hear how all of that rolls in to Absolutely. your enjoyment and your delivery on what you do. I'm so I'm so glad you brought up job description because actually when I read the job description for the job at Branded that I applied for, every single thing on it was like, oh, I'm that. I got that. I got that. I got that. Except for the degree piece. So I was like, I have everything on here except for a degree. I'm still going to apply. Um, and, you know, it was a long series of interviews. I think I interviewed five or six times with different people in the company and and what I've come to learn now being on the other side of that and interviewing people for, for jobs on our team, we, I'm lucky to work for a company that values life experience and non-traditional forms of education as, you know, equal merit to traditional forms of education. We hire for the person, for the perspective, for the understanding the ability to communicate and the ability to engage as a human being more than we hire for a specific skill because we believe that skills can be taught we believe that skills can be uh shared and grown uh, but what can't be taught or grown it as easily are things like emotional intelligence are things like the ability to collaborate uh, the ability to listen the ability to be a self-starter um, that takes way more work than just checking off a certain, you know, credential on a, on a checklist. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think I, I'm totally on point with you in that. It's like, how do we empower, you know, our staff or ourselves when we're looking at changing our jobs or trying something new to really zero in on what are my skills that 
cannot be taught? You know, what are my innate skills and how do I speak to those on paper so that someone might read that and say, hey, let's give this guy a shot. Let's call them in for an interview and see, uh, see if it's a good fit. So one of our previous guests, Lawrence Tajani, who was kind of, I think it was even like fourth or fifth episode, he and I actually work together still and he he set up a, a community interest company focused on social mobility. So uh, young people who maybe don't have the the background that gives them the edge, but full of potential, full of skills. And, uh, and, and that's kind of what we work, still work together on. And what I notice is, and having worked in education, these kids with so many, re- like uh, so many abilities, but that isn't really reflected in grades and degrees. And I, that bit you said around those skills that are easy to build up if you got them in the house and those bits that are harder. Is anyone telling young people that? <laughs> is, anyway, is, who's communicating that to them of like, actually, these these interpersonal skills you've built up because, you know, you're, you've you spend a lot of time with your grandparents and you're really good at communicating across generation gaps. Like that's mm-hmm. valuable, but does anyone really tell them that? Yeah, I think this is, I, I think no, not enough people are talking about this, um, but I think it is the wave of the future. I think um, even myself, I know that my strongest skills are so, are my soft skills. I, I can, yes, I can use an Excel spreadsheet and I can make things work in, in technology, but that to me is not my strong suit. And um, I think organizations are starting to realize, especially on, again, on this side of the pandemic, where our time, the time that we spend with people is, we're realizing how valuable that is. And we were as a collective feeling the importance of, you know, our mental well being, our social well being, all of these things, which, you know, five years ago weren't necessarily trending in people's minds or in headlines or in articles anywhere. But the only way, you know, from my experience to create context where your mental well being, your social well being are being considered is by addressing the culture in which you're a part of. And in order for a culture to exist, soft skills have to be, uh, centered on some level uh, because we're doing so much more than just working with each other. We're in relationship all day long, sometimes for many years and over, you know, different times, spaces and through stressful and sometimes not stressful situations. So how are we equipping our teams and our people with the value of, we want you to feel good here as well. Um, I don't think, you know, in the last 20 years, that's really been part of the conversation. We're now entering a new phase, I believe, where, you know, how people feel is just as important as what they're being paid. Um, and, and I think we're seeing that in the new generation of, of younger folks who are saying, I'm not going to take that job because it's a waste of my time and my, my life <laughs> on some level. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this shift continues to evolve where soft skills are equally as valued as, you know, hard, hard skills. And I think it, it's interesting you talk about like this shift. You see that shift happening. Um, it, and I wonder about, is that shift more evident in newer organizations that are set up by a more diverse group of people who can start from scratch and a kind of level set of like, at this organization will build it from the ground up with the values with those values rather than trying to retrofit organizations that maybe didn't work that way yeah i mean shifting culture is one of the hardest things to do like changing a system especially a human system um that is so you know subtle and multi-layered into a new paradigm is really tricky work. Um, I know, you know, from my experience, brain data is 10 years old. They're like, we're in our 11th year, but it was founded. It was, it's a female founded and led company and the principles and values 
from the beginning have been uh, very heart centered, very emotionally intelligent, very multi layered. And you can see, you know, everyone that works there. I remember when I first got hired, we go on brain dates with each other to onboard. So we get to know one another uh, in conversations that don't really relate to our job titles, but to us as human beings. I can, I can count on like, both my hands, the amount of times people said, you welcome to, to a place that is not like any other company I've ever worked. It's a different feeling here because we're allowed to express ourselves in ways and we're actually encouraged to form uh, understandings of one another beyond just the work that we have to do. And, and I do think that um, the more diverse voices that are in leadership positions, the more value and understanding of these values will continue to grow and continue to be transferred because there is um, a certain amount of education that has to happen. As you said, are, are our kids being told that these are their skills? And if they're not, where are they learning that their ability to listen is actually just as valuable as their ability to, you know, 3D render something? Um, and it has to come from a place of yeah, leadership where that's being encouraged and that's being welcomed and that's being named. Um, because I think in a lot of our educational facilities uh, that that's still pretty new in terms of an understanding of, you know, skill or uh, yeah, life skills that have value at work as well. I mean, fundamentally it's harder to measure than your ability at, mathematics which is what I taught um and those kind of things but I so I normally at the end will say like any bits of advice but I'd like to pick up on this bit so you're in a company that feels different and that culture seems to actually be what they say it is Mm -hmm. I know some people will talk about the companies that might say one thing but it isn't necessarily replicated any like going in to the process of applying to your applying to brain date was there any kind of telltale signs that you could see as an applicant that it was a more authentic company than than maybe some of the others and like for young people looking for these companies mm. that practice what they preach mm. what are they looking question. for um well, so for brain dates specifically, it's a little bit, I was a little bit biased because I had experienced brain dates at an event a few years before I applied. So I, I felt what their team on site were. I, I engaged with their technology before I even applied for the job. Um, but that's actually part of the advice is like, I would pay attention to what, what, you know, what are the projects or the organizations that you've interacted with that feel good, go and see, you know, what does their website look like? What language are they using? Um, who are their people on LinkedIn? What do their profiles look like? And whether or not that organization is hiring or not, you might start to identify some key uh, signals or some key language or some yeah, some key job descriptions or job titles that might help you shift towards something. For BrainAid specifically, as soon as I read their mission, um, I knew that it was really human centered. I had also the opportunity to listen to the founder, Christine Renault, um, speak before. And so I, I, was able to go and do a little bit more research also on the blog of the company and and read some of the material that they're putting out. I don't think there's any organization now um, that doesn't have sort of content output. And so I would highly recommend like doing your research, reading a little bit deeper, watching the interview of the founder, getting a sense of the language they use, the way they communicate, uh, and really looking at the founder is a really great way, I feel, to see... Um, the personality of the company. And if you have the opportunity to uh, interview with different people to really also ask the questions that you want to ask in that interview. And remember that you're not, they're not just interviewing you, you're also interviewing them. And I remember when I interviewed for Brain Date, I asked some pretty brave questions um, where I was saying, you know, what are you doing to address inclusion of trans and non-binary people in your organization? I identify as that. And it's important for me to know that if I'm stepping in there, the leadership has a response to that question, one, or if they don't, they're willing to engage in a conversation in a way that feels good to me. Um, And so for me, those are the sort of things that I uh, 
would recommend. Yeah, I think that's really good advice, and and um, I, I like that. Yeah, it's a two way street, right? You are absolutely yeah. checking, and particularly, for, yeah, like you say for yourself, like pressing them on this is the way I identify, and, and am I going to feel comfortable? Mm-hmm. You know, is is it an inclusive space that that's going to fit? Absolutely yeah, on right on, what, on what on whatever values you have, you know, and it doesn't. It could be about you know what's your policy on uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the fact that we take airplanes often, you know, um, yeah. So those are things. There's another also. You may I'm sure you've heard of B Corp, uh, the B Corp organization. Generally, those organizations tend to have pretty strong, clear values, transparent values. Branding is a B Corp. So that, again, lent itself to me being like, I can trust this. Um, so if there are, you know, listeners trying to, you know, just get zeroed in on where to start, look up B Corp in your area. You can definitely start there and hopefully find some some great opportunities that way as well. Neat, neat. So I think... To build this bigger picture then, we obviously talked a bit about Brain Date and kind of your work within there, but you did mm-hmm. mention that you also have other projects going on as well. So mm-hmm. if I remember correctly, you have got the community projects, which you talked about. I'd love to know a bit more about that and kind of how that fits in around, because you say you've been doing that for a long time. Yeah, so the community dance project that I'm a part of is called the Migration Dance Film Project. Uh, and it was founded and created by a woman here in Montreal, where I'm based, named Sandy Silva, uh, who I met actually at a meditation class, you know, the first week that I arrived to the city. And we got talking about, you know, our practices. Uh, I'm a musician and a dancer. She is also a body, uh, a musician and a, and a dancer. And we she invited me to join her, her company, um, just to see if I was a good fit. They were, and 10 years later, we meet weekly for a weekly practice. And it's a group of anywhere, you know, depending on people's availability and as groups shift over time, uh, you know, it's been as small as five people all the way up to 12 people, uh, intergenerational. So Sandy herself is in her sixties. There's, I at the time was the youngest one. I was like 25 when I started. Um, And we meet weekly to explore body music or body percussion. Um, And we collaborate in exploration and research. And then we get funding to create films in collaboration with other organizations or other communities in different parts of the world. And the themes of the project are to, you know, identify migration so has how humans travel over space and time and from culture to culture um and it's been a, an incredible privilege to be a part of a an artistic practice that is rooted in relationship rooted in showing up for one another you know some weeks we're just showing up and we don't really know why we're rehearsing there's nothing we don't have a performance we don't have a, a deadline but we show up to engage in this form of embodiment and this form of listening as a practice for you know tuning our own instrument as human beings um, and our nervous systems as human beings but also to play and to have fun and to um take care of ourselves and each other relationally in that sense um so i've been really really moved to be a part of that. And that's, you know, one of the main reasons why I actually stay in this city, because it feeds a part of my soul and it feeds a part of my creativity that doesn't get fed as um, basically, or as uh, maybe basic isn't word, but like as essentially as it does in, uh, in other forms of collaboration or community work. I think what, what I kind of honed in on is from a personal point of view is when you said you, you'd meet, not because you had a performance or because there was something coming up. And I think I really struggle with that of, of kind of making a value judgment about, well, why, why, what's the, what's the, the aim of this? And actually, I think when I was talking to Brittany, um, who by the time anyone's listening to this, they'll have heard, potentially heard Brittany's one, but it's, it's At this point in time, it's about to come out next week. But Brittany and I were talking about social media, actually. But I was saying I I always seem to sort of be at find my purple patch, be it my mojo was when I would actually put my commitments out there. So like write a blog. Because then I said Mm -hmm. I was gonna do it. 
So mm-hmm. I seem to be quite, quite driven by, oh, I put it out there that it said do it. So that was really interesting about f- not just putting value in <laughs> that there's a deadline, mm-hmm. but putting value in being in the moment, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Do you also find that you the value you talked about there, the kind of, was it essential, the word you came back to? Mm-hmm. Did you f- discover that by not doing it for a few weeks, so stepping away from it and realizing you were missing something? I think I realized it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it was like a slow creep in where I realized I don't know what my week would be without this. These people, and it was relational. And to me, again, I guess this does come back to like, what is my driving force on the planet in this body? It's like to have meaningful relationships, whether that's a a work relationship or a creative relationship, or you're my neighbor. Um, we're here now and, and, and how are we showing up to life together to have an exchange that is mutually beneficial and nourishing? I think like beyond all layers of, you know, um, identity or responsibility or role that you've been assigned uh, as a human being, that's really what we're all here for. Um, and so I think through the leadership of Sandy, the choreographer, and sort of just like holding true to that flag, it, it just became innate to how I exist in this space. And, and that to me is what real community is. I think there's a lot of organizations and there's you know, the community has become this sort of buzzword around, you know, but what is actual community? And to me, it's like, you, it's, it's where and who you show up to when you don't need to, when you don't, when you, when there, when there isn't a, a, a crisis, but also when there is, <laughs> you know, like who are you beholden to and who are, where are the, what are the threads that are connecting you um, through time and space that keep you coming back to the same experience or the same shared, you know, vision. Um, and that totally transformed my understanding as someone who, you know, coming from musical theater was conditioned to, you know, have eight weeks of rehearsal and then three months of a show and then go on to the next thing. And maybe you'd see other people from the previous production in your next production or not. But the, the sort of capitalistic approach to that sort of creativity um, wired me in a way that was so different and yeah, I think it was more of a slow emergence of realizing the value that 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 this dance community dance project whole held for me. Um, and I did, you know, so my father passed away two summers ago, pretty suddenly, and I had to move back home to be with my family for several months. And I wasn't, you know, I was in shock. We were all dealing with our things, but I remember getting uh, an envelope from the dance company that I was totally not expecting. I don't even know how they got the address to where I was. Um, And I was so moved by that to realize, wait, these, these people are my people beyond whether I'm with them in the dance studio or not. Um, We formed a bond that goes beyond what we're trying to produce. Um, And I think, I think that's the secret ingredient there. And I, you know, there's different ways in which I felt that, but um, yeah, to answer your question, it was like a slow progression. And I think what I've come to learn from that is that time is the essential ingredient there. It, it is something that requires time to get that, to develop that trust, to develop that bond or to develop that yeah, connection. Also interesting there then in that around the dance is you talked about that like the shows the rehearsal then show 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 for a long period like i physically imagine incredibly demanding yeah um versus the community like it's it's dance and body movement but worlds apart in terms of the way it works uh, and i know that you have had to kind of a you, in terms of your dance, you've had a, a knee surgery, mm-hmm. which I presume has kind of changed the outlook a little bit on that as well. Absolutely. Well, even before that injury, so yeah, to, so I was trained in a conservatory musical theater program where we were essentially training our bodies at the level 
of Olympic athletes. You were doing a lot of technique, a lot of strength and conditioning, both physically for your muscles and, you know, your flexibility, but also for your vocal abilities and um, your emotional capacities. And all of these things have to be stretched and grown and exercised and trained, um, which, you know, as someone in their 20s and that's amazing. I had the best time. I was in the best shape of my life. And then of course, you know, you're so excited to be getting jobs and to be working and using your instrument, which is your body and your heart and your mind, all of the, all of it together at once. And it feels thrilling. Um, but to, to, you know, to directly respond to you, yeah, eight shows a week, sometimes, you know, two shows a day, full energy output by the end of the week, you're a shell of a being, you know, um, and, you know, often that industry, especially at the time that I was doing it, was coupled with, you know, you go out for drinks after the show, you go out to eat after the show, you don't get home till 2, 3 a.m., then you sleep in till 11 or noon, and it just is this cycle that continues, which absolutely I had a lot of fun doing, but is, from my perspective, not the most sustainable thing, which is why I ended up transferring into yoga because I wanted to stay embodied. I wanted to stay in that form of exchange with other human beings, but have it be rooted in a system of care and rooted in a more sustainable rhythm. Um, and yeah, since then I did have a knee injury. Um, I had to get part of my knee replaced and um, now I think as anyone who's aging in a body um, who realizes, you know, they're fallible and they have limits, um, it's really humbling, but it's also really important to, for me, um, to, to slow down and to realize the value of presence and time, um, both in our mental capacities, but also in our physical capacities. How can we create structures and practices or opportunities in our life that allow us to really hold the tempo, the pace, the fullness of ourselves in a way that can continue and, and that we're not depleting ourselves. And, you know, sustainability is such a hot topic and often the mind goes to the planet, but we are also our own home, right? Like if our, if we can't sustain our bodies in a way, um, really that's limiting the extent to which our lives can be fully expressed. Um, and so I think those, those things go hand in hand and slowing down is a big part of it for me. I mean, I, mean, I suppose a big difference between you and I, I'm going to tell you this is that you have, actively experience what the body is fully capable of i may not have really that concept in my life um but it like that i'm i'm always imagine that must be harder when you really know what 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 can be achieved with the human body that as you get a bit older and it's not quite as feasible uh, well you know what's so amazing one? well i think it's how you measure what achievement is i think for me i i think um yeah, if I think purely physical in terms of, you know, what flexibility or what strength I had, absolutely, I've transformed and, and like, oh, I wish I could still do that with my leg or whatever. Um, but there's such a richer layer to being in a body in terms of an interoceptive capacity to be able to feel and understand what your body is processing. And to me, achievement could be measured or, you know, used in different ways. Um, so in terms of feeling fully alive in a body, I think, um, yeah, I would sort of open curiosity around what that could feel like or what that could mean beyond um, sort of per external uh, representation of what we think that looks like to think about more what that feels like. And presumably the community project the dance project you're involved in goes a long way to to that end as well of using like like you said a range of age groups and backgrounds and but still mm -hmm. like that that expression that you are able to kind of get out of the group i imagine is probably yeah. a, a good example of that yeah, it's really cool because, you know, as our group, our, our, our close circle, you know, we, because we meet weekly, we've been able to develop a vocabulary of movement that is quite complex and 
it's body music. So it's rhythmic. It's based in rhythms. And some of the rhythms we're working with are, if you're familiar with time signatures and music are like 17 on four. Um, so they're really complicated uh, cycles of rhythm that um, work both as a, a meditation for us. Um, but we've been able, you know, when we first started, I'm the first one to say when I first started, I was lost in the in the movement and i had to develop the ability to to get there now i can do it with my eyes closed and sing a different rhythm a polyrhythm on top of it and move through space and think about the camera angles but it took you know i've been doing this for 10 years with that company and the communities that we intersect with some of them are professional musicians some of them are professional dancers and then a very important part of the work is working with pedestrians or locals who aren't trained and we do workshops with them to introduce some of the sort of most basic form of movement which is just clapping or snapping breathing singing um and the most beautiful aspect of these films is seeing how all of those things create uh you know a really dynamic expression of human experience across as you said uh diversity of, of participants I think it gives me a lot to think about personally, actually, uh, uh, around that. You know, I'm in my 40s, getting a bit older. It's it, it's an interesting area. I don't know how deep I can go into that, but uh, I've got some I've got some pondering to do, Drew. Thank you. Mm, you're <laughs> I welcome. I need to find find an equivalent of your of your community around me. Yeah, I'm sure really. there. I'm, I hope they're ready too. And if they're not, you can start it. Put up your flag and see what happens. If anyone could do it, I think you could. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if the moves that I pull off in the kitchen while cooking quite count, but uh, hey, it's all a starting point, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Me. So really, thank you so much for going back into that particular community project. Um, I feel like we probably haven't done quite enough around the well not that I'm proportioning it but the <laughs> obviously you mentioned yoga um mm. and sort of hinted at how that uses it but around sort of that general wellness um, yeah you, you obviously had the you had the business around that I believe yeah um so I'd love to explore a little bit around yes you talked about brain day We've also talked about the community project that keeps you centered and 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 kind of yeah feed your mind and body, um, but just for I think we talked about that company culture, mm-hmm. and I think the wellness piece and how you're approaching that, how you have approached it with previous work, mm-hmm. is really interesting to explore. Um, so yeah, so from the yoga to the wellness career. Yeah. Um, is that a reasonable point to jump onto? Absolutely. And thanks you for, thank you for bringing that back up because I would say that up until this point in terms of my career, that's definitely been the most uh, laborious in terms of investment from me as a human being. Um, so post, as I mentioned earlier, post uh, my 20s, um, moving back to... So I, I, I left performing arts to go back to school for a hot minute before dropping out again. Um, I attempted to do a bachelor, uh, a business degree um, and dropped out after my first semester, realizing that I had all the artistic capacity I needed. But what I was lacking was this idea, you know, my upon the advice of my brother and my father, you know, learn a skill that you don't have so you can make money. Why don't you try to go to business school? Um, I, I took their advice and I tried to transfer out of a, a fine arts program into a business program, lasted a semester, decided to drop out. I was not physically or mentally well and realized that I wanted to start my own business. I had moved to Montreal um, after living in Toronto and then Boston where I was at school and realized I didn't really have a community space because I had grown up in or spent a lot of time in, in Toronto attending a yoga studio, as well as being a part of the, the artistic community. I really had a good sense of reference coming to Montreal. Um, I felt the desire for a space that I 
couldn't find. And I was so lucky to have met uh, a partner um, who's now my, you know, we've been together 10 years, we live together, um, who encouraged me, you know, said, you know, stop working for other people's studios. If you don't feel like your gifts are being received there, if you don't feel, you know, reflected and seen in those spaces, why don't you try opening your own space? enough people are encouraging you or asking you to. And I said, okay, you know what, why don't I just try? Um, so, you know, I scrapped together $10,000 to like start my first yoga studio and found a, a small, you know, unit to rent, uh, that didn't cost very much and put up a flag and said, okay, this is my space. I'm looking for, this is the practice that I'm interested in and the way of showing up to community that I want to hold. And, you know, really quickly after, you know, not even a year, it started to get very busy, very popular. And I was finding like-minded community p people who lived in my area that also wanted a space that they could go to, to be in their bodies and be with each other and learn about how to take care of themselves and also have fun um, outside of their houses. And uh, my approach to this yoga work was always twofold. It was about you know, educating people about their biomechanical capacities so that they could take better care of themselves and feel more, you know, centered and in control of themselves physically, which has an effect on your mental health, um, as well as create a container for relationship building and hopefully a little bit of fun to be had. Um, I'm a huge proponent of if we're not having fun, what are we doing? Um, and, and, a lot of the spaces that I had been interacting with previous to mine were very serious about yoga. They were very serious about like, and it just felt so insincere <laughs> to me to show up in that way. Although I have great reverence and respect for the practice of yoga and the benefits that it holds for us all. I do think there's a way to engage in, in that work that centers a sense of fun and a sense of um, playfulness. So long story short, I'll try to make it short, but we do have time. Uh, I ended up expanding this business with a friend who it was getting so busy and I couldn't keep up. I also was not francophone. I'm not francophone. I do speak French, but it was, it's not my first language and having a business in Montreal, which is French speaking Canada, it's really important to have a strong grasp of the language. And I, you know, was still pretty fresh in my years here. Um, so I ended up partnering with someone who had more experience in French and also shared very similar ideas around creating a space for people who didn't see themselves reflected in other spaces. Um, and so we expanded on what was my original just yoga studio to create more of a movement center that had different forms and modalities of moving your body. And we reoriented and sort of refocused a little bit deeper on creating Canada's first gender and body neutral space for fitness and wellness. And it was called Element Studio. And um, we set, we designed a space that had, you know, no gendered areas. So there were private change cabins, private showers, you came in, you did your own thing. And we also had no mirrors and no sort of reference as to what you looked like to motivate you behind your movement. It was all about how you felt. And at first, and this was, you know, at this point now, nine years ago, seven or seven, to maybe eight, let's say eight years ago. Um, and the community was receptive to it, but they didn't really, they didn't get it. They're like, why, why is there no women's change room? Why is there? And we had to be like, well, we just want to empower people to have their own space. So they're private cabins. Um, and we didn't even realize how radical that was at the time. Um, it just made sense to us. Uh, and it, and it was, in truth, just part of, partly was due to the limitations of the space. But then also I was like, why did, why did they have to have group anything? Like just let someone go in and change and then go out. Um, and then, but what was very intentional was no mirrors, no cell phones allowed in the space. There, it wasn't a space to show off who you are and what you were doing. It was a space for you to go in and experience what you were doing and be in relationship with the actual people that are there with you, not, your audience online or, or any of that. Um, and it was pretty radical, especially in this city at that time, um, to sort of challenge the fitness industry around 
you know, motivation behind showing up to a space and why do you keep coming back? Are you coming back to lose weight? Are you coming back because you feel stronger and your head is clearer and you've made friends? Are you coming back because, you know, you learn, you're learning about your musculature and you're learning how to adapt movements that suit your unique needs in your body at this time. Um, and really we quickly realized that we were creating a container that was so needed. And uh, after three years of one location, we expanded into a second and we had huge brand partnerships that we were going to scale nationally. I was actually on my way to like sign a contract the day the city shut down for the pandemic. And um, all of this sort of got interrupted, uh, I would say, by the pandemic and, you know, interrupted this sort of 10 year plan we had for really establishing a culture of wellness that expanded beyond the physical, but included the emotional, the mental, and the relational, um, all within the, the the structures of. If you would think of service design, it was it was a fitness studio. You could go take a spin class, you could take a meditation class, you could take a Pilates class or a yoga class. Um, but at the end of the day, it was really a community space, um, camouflaged by those things. I think that you say it was like you sensed it was needed and clearly it was because it grew. Mm. As you're talking, I'm thinking about the concept of go, I don't like the gym would be my like initial feeling like, oh no, I don't like the gym. I like, Same. I like if I can go for a run in the forest, that's obviously much more preferable or get on my bike. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't like that version of the gym. <laughs> Yeah, we were told that so much by people. They're like, I, uh, I don't know. I don't work out. I don't like the gym. I, can, I, I don't, I don't do spin classes or whatever. And then you know, three classes later, they're like, I'm a brand new person. I never thought I would feel safe and engaged in a gym or in a in a fitness space. And it's because we were, we were really kind of tearing that down and rebuilding it, centering again. One of our core values was fun and playfulness, like we should be curious about our bodies. How can we delight ourselves through movement and discover new ways of being through this Pilates class, which, you know, not everyone's down for that. Some people just want to go and have their butts kicked. <laughs> and people who would come to our classes would be like, yo, that was a very challenging class. But I also, you know, laughed my ass off partway through and I wasn't expecting to, to do that. And, you know, we also didn't appeal to everyone, which was absolutely fine by us um <laughs> so, yeah i mean that's there's certain things in the business aren't there i know when like people critique a business for a stance they've taken and some businesses are nice to come back like well yeah we definitely don't want you to engage with us thanks based on what you just said so exactly <laughs> yeah it's clear it's like you're either with this you know perspective or you're not and we can't be for everyone, so... Yeah, yeah it's like, clearly we're, we're going out specific here on what we <laughs> want to do. So, obviously, like, yeah, I could sense when you were talking, I was like, oh, I feel like we're in 2019, 2020 here. Um, so is that is that something you want to try and get back to? I mean, it, maybe it was a bit of a moment, but I would... Sound yeah. like it's got legs. I mean... Thank you for asking. And I can't tell you how many people have asked me that. Um, I get, I still get Instagram messages, you know, to this day that says, you know, nothing compares to what you guys used to do. Will it, won't you please come back? Um, and for both my business partner and I, especially the governmental regulations in our province in Quebec were very strict. Over the two years, we were only able to be open for a total of four months. Um, and there was some financial support, but long story short, it was pretty grueling on us mentally, emotionally, and financially. We had to really like, the reason we had to stop was because we weren't, we also were self-funded. We didn't have financial backing. We were really self-made and we weren't necessarily interested in taking a large financial, you know, investment because we wanted to keep the essence of what we were doing alive. And we didn't have anyone, we didn't have really anyone interested at the time that we felt the values were aligned with. Um, what's interesting is that for both, for me specifically, the project was never started as 
with the envision, like with the idea to make as much money as possible, it was really to hold, create a container for a community. Um, and, and that is really at the end of the day, I was like, we could either just like sell this thing and go for it, uh, and but get investment or we can shut down. And we ultimately, we were burnt out. We were like on the verge of like complete. Yeah, it was a really hard two years. Um, it was really, really a struggle um, to feel like your whole vocation suddenly had no value because the government didn't deem it as essential um, to feel like even who you specific, not specific, but some people from your community that you thought would be there through and through, you know, could no longer show up in the way that they were able to previously. And it all got dismantled and people's behaviors changed, um, people's comfort levels changed. And even the numbers upon which we built the business uh, in terms of how many bodies could fit into a space were no longer possible. Um, mm. So it really was not viable from a business perspective. Obviously, I'm very passionate about what we do and why we do it. Um, I don't know if I need a physical brick and mortar space for me to continue to show up in that way. Um, I, as I mentioned, um, I am part of a studio here now that one of our former teachers opened. And so we've been mentoring her in creating her space and helping her grow her community. And I show up in the ways that I can, but I am really actually surprisingly very into having sort of a more structured nine to five schedule with a guaranteed income and then to offer my gifts and my passions in a way that aren't necessarily financially motivated, but more in terms of contributing to the community that I'm a part of and also potentially raising awareness or creating, you know, a different lens on on how we can show up to these practices. Um, so something that I'm looking at doing and building out our brand relationships that I can show up and still use my you know, name and my talents in a way to highlight an important uh, community event or to raise funds for something. Or uh, for me, I'm more interested in working in that way. Um, I do have a few business ideas that are sort of bubbling up to the surface, but um, I'm going to be pretty uh, selective in what that, how that takes shape and if that takes shape and in what time that might work. Um, but, uh, but yeah, wellness, I think, um, yeah, I'm more interested in working more as a consultant and, col you know, using my skills and bringing that awareness into different, different spaces at this point in my life. There's so many other great spaces and uh, yeah. I feel like that chapter has kind of shifted and uh, yeah, I don't know if I want to own a physical space anymore. I mean, like it obviously sounds incredibly gratifying in terms of what you built, but then with the context of the pandemic, I imagine incredibly hard and, and you know, some things maybe they sit in a moment in time and to sort of, you know, recreating it is probably a tricky thing, but like you say, you you're, supporting the next version of that the mm -hmm. evolution of that and mm -hmm. still involved in that way so that makes sense that makes sense um and there's a whole theme here like as we as i kind of come towards the end of our of our conversation I, I, there's a bringing people together seems to be the the common theme whether that was doing it through creativity and the theater or the performances or whether that was through the community through yoga through the studio and now you've just found another way to do it through brain day it's really interesting uh trajectory and what i've found with with most of these um with these conversations i get to have um uh, is that there are yeah these themes come through sometimes people have spotted it themselves and other times i think they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> they, <laughs> they just kind of follow it through like, oh, I, I see a theme. And they're like, oh, so it is. <laughs> so, but like bringing people together is clearly, that's your purpose, right? Yeah. I mean, I love human beings. I think human beings are the most amazing creatures. And I really believe in our capacity to show up and make meaning out of the out of life in our creative capacities but also in our relational capacities and so we need each other to make life valuable otherwise life is pretty boring and 
unfulfilling, I would say, I would argue. Um, so yeah, I think that is my theme or my thread is how can we call in more engaged forms of living with each other, whether that's, you know, in, uh, through a conversation in a networking environment or, you know, in a community centered creative practice, how are we choosing to show up as our whole selves, listen to one another and engage in, you know, the gift of what life really is, is being here with each other right now and opening ourselves up to one another's experience. Um, yeah, I think that's definitely my theme, my goal, my belief, and my purpose. And I think it, I'm really lucky that I found different avenues in which to explore that. No, I, didn't, I mean, in terms of, therefore, the, the, the final question I tend to ask people is, if you could do anything, what would you do? And I think, we're, yeah, I, I imagine there's some bringing people together aspect to it, but I'm, I'm now stalling to give you time because it's obviously got a big question at the end. <laughs> but yeah, if you, could, if you could do anything, what would you do? If I could do anything, what would I do? I feel like if I could do anything, I would continue to co-design spaces and opportunities for people to gather, to come together, to learn, to have some form of embodied experience that transforms their perspective on their life from that point forward. Whether that's, you know, a single night yoga event that someone goes to, or whether it's, you know, a 10 day retreat somewhere where you're going through deeper learnings and exchanges with other people. Um, I think ultimately that's the level of work that I would like to be doing is facilitating these shared human experiences across sort of demographics and industries. Um, sometimes with a very specific intention and other times with just sort of general curiosity around, you know, what, what could be discovered here. Um, and yeah, I think that, I think that answers that question for me. And that feels really like open and light. So I think that's a good answer. I think it's perfect. <laughs> And I, it could maybe be argued that the more people can come together in those ways, maybe some of the challenges that we face might be uh, potentially diluted a little bit, polarization, all these things. So I, I think, I, I think you know, it would not be a it would not be a bad thing if you went on to do that. <laughs> Thank you. I hope so. I hope not. I hope. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I, I agree. I think that the more we can practice sort of showing up for each other with the intention to be together and not be apart and think that we're doing life on our own because we're really not, that's, that's impossible. That's not how nature works. Um, the more that we can reorient ourselves, even if it's toward someone who we don't agree with, but yet find ways to share space with them and understand their perspective, whether we agree with it or not. Um, that's really the, where we're at in the world now, I think. And without that happening, I'm, I'm not so hopeful in terms of where we could be going. And I think enough of us, um, crave a vision of the future that feels, um, more human than not. Um, and, and that's the only way to do it is with each other, not without each other. Going back to some of the threads from before you talked about, you know, what you're seeing within organizations, um, the expectations of young people going into work about finding that balance as well. It feels like ultimately that is the direction of travel, even though there are a lot of deviations and speed bumps and, and barriers that seem to appear, but generally I don't, I see that some positivity out there that kind of aligns with that as well. Mm. Nate, Drew, I knew you'd be a great guest. <laughs> I knew it. Thank so, you. Thank, so really, so pleased we managed to get the time in, in between uh, a busy schedule. Um, so equally, if you are kind of back in Montreal for a little period of time hopefully you get a chance to really sort of settle into that before you fly off to your next destination to bring more people together um thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure 
and uh, yeah, maybe maybe we can sort of schedule a follow up episode in the uh, in a little while and see see what the progression is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ben. This has been really fun and thoughtful, and I'm super glad to have reconnected with you. So absolutely, let's please keep in touch, and you can help hold me accountable to some of these things. And I'm curious to learn like what your community movement practice ends up being. Um, so I will definitely be following up with you on that as well. Neat, you've pinned me down to it now. That's good work. <laughs> Sorry, it's out there. It's out Do there. It. <laughs> Unless you edit it out, but... <laughs> I do have that power, that's true. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> awesome.